Let's do a full overview of Scientology, its ideas, how it operates, how it wields its power and influence. And let's start at the very basics. What is Scientology? Scientology is a belief system created by L. Ron Hubbard that does fundamentally believe that we are all immortal spiritual beings called Thetans, that we have native godlike potential, that there is nothing more powerful in the universe than a Thetan. Like, so godlike is, you know, quite literal here. And that through various decisions Thetans have made, they have fallen away from their native godlike power to uh, fallen down to a state where most Thetans aren't even aware that they are Thetans, aren't even aware that they ever um, have lived before or have these powers. And that Thetans are now in, in a state where they're trapped in bodies, trapped here on earth, uh, trapped in this prison of a physical universe, trapped on this prison of a planet. And that only Scientology can restore a Thetan to its native state. Are these multiple beings? Like, is there one Thetan inside of me that's trapped in this prison? Well, the thing um, would be you. The thing would be me. The Thetan is you. But I'm presumably limited in some fundamental way. So this Thetan that is me is, is limited. So there's like 8 billion Thetans on the planet. There's one primary Thetan animating each body. Later in Scientology, you learn there's actually like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of like sick, unconscious, half dead Thetans stuck to you that are huh. now the, an additional cause of problems for you. Sure. But fundamentally at the lower levels, the non-confidential levels, there's just one Thetan per body. Well, I mean, it's an interesting idea. I just would like to kind of explore the philosophy of that. So there's a being that's all powerful, that's immortal, and its projection, its manifestation on this earth is fundamentally limited. And you're trying to, uh, the process of Scientology is the process of uh, letting go of those limitations. You know, that's an interesting idea. I mean, a lot of religions have this kind of idea that there's uh, not just religions, but like uh, we have the capacity as human beings to do, to achieve greatness in all kinds of ways. Yeah. And that, that's the question we have with our cognitive abilities. We start with an embryo and build up and into this organism and like this world of opportunities before us, what are we capable of? And the idea that we're capable of almost anything is a really powerful one. And there's a lot of religions, there's a lot of philosophies, there's a lot of advice, self-help that kind of explore those ideas. And so in, it seems like with Scientology, this, the application of this religious philosophy means that there's, we're limited and we have to break the, through those limitations. And there's a process to break through those limitations. That would be correct. So what can make it challenging to adequately and completely describe Scientology in the beginning is what Scientologists believe actually changes as they progress further into or further up in Scientology. So um, the explanation as I've given it is pretty consistent with what you would get at the lowest levels, right? right? You're a Thetan, I'm a Thetan, everyone's a Thetan, and we have a reactive mind. L. Ron Hubbard would say the reactive mind is a collection of uh, these recordings, mental recordings of any moments of pain and unconsciousness you've ever had in your life. It's like the subconscious mind. Uh, it's always recording in moments of pain and unconsciousness. And that these are called, uh, these recordings are called, L. Ron Hubbard called them engrams. Mm -hmm. Now, when L. Ron Hubbard first wrote Dianetics in 1950, this was before Scientology came along he, uh, a couple years later, right? So in 1950, when he wrote Dianetics, it wasn't a spiritual, endeavor. It was supposed to be a mental health, a science of mental health. Mm -hmm. So as of that time, the earliest engram you could have was the incident of birth. Being born mm -hmm. was an engram. And uh, technically in Dianetics, he said you could have prenatal engrams, like when you're still in the womb. Mm -hmm. But there was no concept of past lives as of 1950 version of Dianetics, right? And so the idea there was that uh, the reactive mind is essentially a stimulus response mechanism uh, created through evolution millions of years ago to protect the individual from things that would harm them. In other words, things that would bring about pain and unconsciousness. So you have these recordings of things that hurt you, mm -hmm. created pain and unconsciousness. And in present time, these things will react upon you 
in a way to cause you to avoid similar things reacting upon you in a, in a subconscious, unconscious way. So the reactive mind protects you from the trauma that is inside your subconscious mind. Yes, and the idea is we've now, as human beings, evolved to a state where it no longer serves us beneficially, it only serves us negatively. Mm -hmm. This was Hubbard's theory. And he said, so you can get rid of these engrams by you know, basically recalling them and going over them again and again using Dianetics auditing therapy. And if you get back to the moment of birth and erase the earliest engram, all the other subsequent engrams on the chain would vanish. Oh, nice. So there's a chain. Earlier, similar, earlier, similar, earlier, similar, earlier, similar. Okay. So that gives you a pretty good understanding of how L. Ron Hubbard thought of the mind, because that carries on, has applicability later on in Scientology. I mean, that's a pretty powerful model of the mind. I mean, Freud had similar conceptions that a lot of our traumas are grounded in sort of uh, poor formulation of sexuality or imperfect formulation of sexuality in early childhood, something like this. And then we're trying to figure out the puzzle of whatever we formed in early childhood. Right. I mean, it's similar, similar kind of- It is similar. It's probably what Hubbard took it from. Um, in the early days of Dianetics, before he decided psychiatry was evil, yes. uh, he actually credited Sigmund Freud with some of the shoulders he was standing on sure. in writing Dianetics. So the so he still admired psychiatry at that time. So that's an interesting yes. moment of Dianetics. So what else, you mentioned Dianetics, auditing was there too. So if we just, before Scientology, what, what are the ideas that formed what we know as Dianetics. As I've just described, that is the fundamental. That, like, is, okay. that is pretty much the nuts and bolts of Dianetics. Was it applied? Was it applied often? Oh yeah, no, that's what Dianetics in the early days was all about, was just auditing. Auditing is the process of the one-on-one -on -one counseling, recall a moment of pain and unconsciousness, run through the engram over and over and over again, find something earlier similar. That is Dianetics auditing. One of the main things that changed with Scientology is that birth or prenatal engrams were no longer the earliest engrams on the chain. Yeah. The idea is you have to get the earliest engram on the chain for the later ones to blow, which is a race. Mm -hmm. And so, but all of a sudden now with the uh, addition of an immortal spiritual being into the equation, well, now the earliest incident could be trillions of years ago in other galaxies and universes. Other universes? So before the oh, origin yeah. of this universe? Yes. Is there a model of physics integrated in any of this? No. Okay. The model is you have the physical universe, and then above that, you have the theta universe. So we used the word Thetan earlier. Mm -hmm. So in Scientology, they also use the word theta. I don't know. Theta is just basically Thetan power. Thetans collectively. So Hubbard would say you have the theta universe, which is senior to the physical universe and creates the physical universe. Mm -hmm. And remember, I said, I said native godlike potentials. So we're not talking about the god who created the earth. We're just like Scientologists don't believe in a god, but we'll get into that later. Uh, we're talking about cre just creating universes. Like, just think like Matrix. Like, just yeah. when I say creating universe, essentially just creating different Thetan simulations. But it sounds like a little bit more like the ideas of Plato, which is there's these platonic forms, there's abstract forms that are bigger, more general than our particular reality here. And those forms are used to construct the reality. Well, I grew up in a cult, so I'm not familiar with the works of Plato. <laughs> You can't use that as an excuse for everything. <laughs> I would like to, you know, non-jokingly yeah. steal man the case because a lot of philosophies, a lot of religions, a lot of even scientific endeavors are a little bit full of uh, uncertainty. You can call it bullshit, but they're, you're on, on sturdy ground because we're surrounded by mystery. And you have to take these ideas somewhat seriously and see where those ideas go wrong. This happens with communism, this happens with capitalism. These ideas sound be beautiful in their ideal forms, and then they somehow go wrong, and some go more wrong than others. And so I don't think sort of, it's easy to sort of caricature and make fun of the ideas. I think if we take them seriously, you'll start to understand like, when you're in it, it was serious. Uh, it can be very convincing. It's, you know, the, the, the devil is going to be a charismatic person. He's not going to be a caricature, a ridiculous person. So that, that helps us understand which ideas uh, will sound appealing, but will become dangerous. I totally agree. In fact, it's one of the <sighs> thrusts uh, I have on my channel is wanting to talk about Scientology in a way that would actually resonate with 
current Scientologists, yeah. not just resonate with former Scientologists. I want people who are still in to be able to hear how I talk about it and go, wow, he's being really fair yeah. and really accurate. He's I mean, not just a hater, you know what I mean? If you look at the, you know, let's t take one of the worst places on earth is North Korea. Uh, you have Kim Jong-un. And the reality is there's a lot of citizens of that nation that deeply love the leader because they've grew up in that way. And you, I mean, through fear, through all kinds of manipulation, through propaganda and so on, they're not allowed to love members of their own family. They're not allowed to have romantic love. They're only allowed to have love for the leader. And to reach those people, you have to empathize with the fact that in their eyes, in some sense, this is a great man. This is a God, a messianic figure. You can't just make fun of the ridiculousness of the situation that there's this pudgy person uh, waltzing around creating propaganda. Like how's this? <laughs> with a the, funny haircut. <laughs> with a funny haircut. Like it's so easy, and Hitler too, to make fun of, to make a caricature of the person. But this is a real person, a real person that influenced the minds of millions of people. In the case of Hitler, uh, you know, tens of millions of people and, and created a huge amount of suffering, not because of, um, the caricature version, but because he was a charismatic leader, he was somebody that people deeply, deeply loved. And that just over time, I mean, with the, the abuse of any kind of ideology, this this happens over and over. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting because Scientology is so close to the, uh, to, to, to the core of what is America because so many Americans are involved with it. So it's interesting to study the, the beauty and the power of the ideas that underlie it and where things go wrong. Yeah. And I'll just say, it's interesting to note, you would never get a representative of the Church of Scientology to sit down and have a conversation with you and even be as fair and accurate about Scientology as I'm going to be, which is which is noteworthy. Do you honestly deeply believe that's the case? There's not going to be a high level official that would sit down for a conversation? No. I disagree with you. I hope you're right. Because I think that given the current dynamics of what's happening, I think in order to save, from their perspective, in order to save the, the Church of Scientology, they have to uh, be transparent and authentic, basically steel men their case, but better. You would think so. Well, we'll talk about the other ways you could do that, which is through manipulation, through propaganda, through control media and all that kind of stuff. They paint themselves into a corner of not being able to send a representative out into the world to speak honestly about it because you're literally not allowed to. So when faced, you know, if you're just sitting down with an entertainment journalist, mm -hmm. a representative might be able to fudge their way through an interview, but sitting down uh, for a long form format yeah. interview with someone who is going to ask them about Xenu and the body Thetans and Leah Remini and Lisa McPherson, that's a no-go zone. So, so I, I'm representing why it will never happen, but shit, I would, I would tune in for that interview. I mean, you, I, so I hope you, you do get someone. You don't think David Miscavige would sit down for an interview? I would love to be wrong. You know, in general, journalists in these kinds of situations can be, um, can attack in a way that doesn't empathize and doesn't come from a place of deep knowledge and understanding. And I think it's possible to have serious conversations with people like that in an empathetic way, but it's also in a challenging way. I think there's a huge amount of trust required. And obviously for a, a very secretive organization, the amount of trust, yes, might be too much. Required. Yes. Anyone over there, if they've done their homework, knows you're going to be as fair as anyone in the world's going to be. And yet, there's simply things they're not allowed to talk about. And they're not even allowed to say, I'm not allowed to talk about it. So that's a fundamental part of the Church of Scientology is the secrecy. Yeah. So that's what you're trained as you go up through the ranks is secrecy, secrecy. It's not even a matter of training. It's that there's an entire, the entire upper half of Scientology's bridge is simply confidential. I mean, and I never even did those levels when I was in Scientology. I didn't learn what Scientologists actually believe on those upper levels until after I got out of Scientology and I was freaking born and raised in it. Let's go there. Let's go to your personal story. So you've spent 30 years in Scientology. Yeah, I was four years old when my mom got in. And then about seven years ago, uh, got out. Yeah. And you're on what YouTube channel now? and you're an educator. So I was four years old when my mom got introduced to Scientology. Yeah. And she got in really fast, really quick. Um, so but I was 12 years old when I was taken out of school and started officially full-time working for Scientology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in various capacities, I worked for them from the ages of 12 to the age of 26. Yeah. 
Okay. So, and then I was 34 when I officially parted ways with Scientology, uh, which was really more them officially parting ways with me, but we can get into all that later. That's just kind of how Scientology does it. And what do you do now? in terms of Scientology. So now I run Growing Up in Scientology, the YouTube channel, but what I primarily do is I help run an organization that helps people who are escaping from Scientology. I'm the vice president of the Aftermath Foundation. And um, we created the foundation after the television show, Leah Remini, Scientology in the Aftermath. Mm -hmm. And there was such an outpouring of support from non-Scientologists all over the world. What can we do to help people leave Scientology? that uh, we decided to create a foundation and uh, it's been incredibly successful. We've helped people escape from all regions and echelons of Scientology. We, we, we've accomplished, what we've accomplished is far beyond what we actually envisioned would be possible. It's been a huge success.